So they say we worship Allah this time, we worship this God for rain, we worship this God for traveling. So they believed in Allah, but what was their problem? They associated partners, they didn't worship Allah alone. And so Allah is using this thing that they already believed in. And the majority of mankind throughout the history believed in to use it against them so they can single out Allah out in Rubiya. <coughs> the only few people that never believed in Rubiya is a few, like Fir'aun, who said, and Rabbukum al A'la, who claimed to be a God, and Namrud, and the likes of these people. And today we have the atheists. Uh, Fir'aun is the father of atheism. And so the atheists today and agnostics, they're following the way of Fir'aun. And they have become more plentiful in their latter times. But before, the majority of the people believed in Rububiya. It was a, um, yeah, I need something that was mustaslam, something that was um, given. And so Allah Azza wa used that Rububiya that they already believed in to call them to Tawheed and Rububiya. Is that clear? Is that clear? Tayyip. Ibn Kathir, so now he mentioned the point, then he mentioned the evidence from the Qur'an, then he mentions to you the speech of some of the scholars. He mentions Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was a great professor, explainer of the Qur'an, that he said, after this verse, he said, Al-Khaliqu li hadihi al-ashya huwa mustahiqu lil ibadah The one that created all of these things, the one that created you and those that came before you and sent down rain and, and, and that was mentioned in the verse. He says, al khaliqu li hadihi al ashya the one that created all of these things, huwa al-mustahiqu lil ibadah He is the only one deserving of being worshipped. So this is the same point I was trying to say. If Allah is the only one that gave us all of these affairs of rububiyah, then He is the only one deserving of uluhiyah. Tayyip. Then he mentions So he mentions now, it's clear. Who is our Lord? If you ask who is your Lord, it is Allah. How did you come to know your Lord? Through his signs and verses and his creation. And he mentions the evidences. Then he mentions one second. Yeah. Then he mentions the different types of worship. How first of all Rububiyah is used to establish and call a person to Uluhiyah, now he mentions what is Ibadah, what is worship, and what are his different categories or examples. He says, um, The categories of Ibadah that Allah Azza wa has commanded us with, the example of Mithl al Islam and Iman al Ihsan. It's the likes of Islam and Iman and Ihsan. And from the acts of worship is الدُّعَاءَ والخوف والرجاء والرغبة والرهبة والخشوع والخشية والإنابة والاستعانة والاستغاثة والذبح والنذر وغير ذلك من أنواع العبادة التي أمر الله بها كلها بالله تعالى He says also from the acts of worship examples of acts of worship is and he mentions 14 roughly is number one الدُّعَاءَ that you call upon Allah سبحانه وتعالى الدُّعَاءَ and al-khawf, fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-raja, having hope in Allah. This is an act of worship. Al-tawakkul, putting your trust and reliance upon Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-tawakkul, al-raghba. Al-raghba, we're going to talk about it in detail, but it's uh, it has a specific type of hope. And al-rahba, or is another specific type of fear. wal khashya fear that is coupled with knowledge. والخشوع الخشوع والخشية والإنابة that you turn back to Allah عز وجل in repentance والاستعانة that you seek aid from Allah عز وجل so this is for Allah عز وجل alone you don't seek aid from anyone else and when I talk about examples where it is allowed استعانة and استغاثة استغاثة is seeking aid with Allah عز وجل in times of difficulty and hardship so استعانة is seeking aid with Allah in times of ease at any time استغاثة is seeking aid from Allah عز وجل in times of difficulty إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ إِسْتِغَاثَ وَإِسْتِعَادَ We forgot to mention to seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal الذبح To slaughter something for the sake of Allah and another to make an oath and a vow by Allah Azza wa Jal All of these acts of worship and examples of worship 
is for Allah Azza wa Jal alone and you do not associate any partners with Allah Azza wa Jal in them. The evidence is when the Masajid Alilahi Falatad Rum Allahi Ahada, the same evidence we had earlier on. And all of the Masajid are for Allah, so do not call upon anything, anyone besides Allah. And Masajid here also means, some of the scholars they said, the limbs and the body parts that you use when you are praying, that you do not give it for other for other than Allah Azza wa Jal. Then he moves on to the next thing, which is فَمَنْ صَرَفَ مِنْهَا شَيْئًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَهُوْ مُشْرِكٌ كَافِرٌ You know that worship is for Allah Azza wa Jal alone. And now you know some examples of worship. Dua, khawf, raja, he mentioned those examples. Then he said, فَمَنْ صَرَفَ مِنْهَا شَيْئًا who get, Whoever gives any little piece of worship to so other than Allah Azza wa Jal, any one of these 14 that we have mentioned or more, just one of them, you give it to other than Allah. You give it to a dead person in their grave. You give it to a sheikh. You give it to an angel. You give it to the Prophet Just one of these acts of worship, then you are mushrikun kafir. Then that person is a mushrik, a, a, a polytheist, and a disbeliever. Why? Because he's associated this act of worship to other than Allah. These acts of worship, all of them, all of them have to be for Allah Azza alone. And then he mentions the evidence. So here he mentions something that's serious. He mentions that whoever gives this dua or this uh, seeking aid of Allah Azza to so other than him, he says, Ya Muhammad. He seeks aid with Muhammad or Jibra'il. And they're good people, let alone people that seek aid with shayateen and jinn. If someone does this, any one of these acts of worship, then what is he? A disbeliever. Is there something big or not? Then what's the evidence? You have to have evidence, right? He mentions the evidence. وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَاهًا آخَرَ لَا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ He says, Whoever calls upon other than Allah, so calling dua is an act of worship. Whoever calls upon other than Allah, shay'an, a small affair, anything, he says, he says, Ya Muhammad, send down rain. Ya Muhammad, Muhammad Hassan died, he can't listen, he can't hear he you, he can't help you. Ya Muhammad, Help turn the camera off. He's making dua to other than Allah to do something small, 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 small. La burhan Allah. He has no evidence and burhan and proof for it. Then he is judgment and his hisab is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah azza wa jal, he says, Inna la al kafirun. Indeed, the kuffar, the disbelievers will never be successful. So Allah Azza wa Jalla at the beginning He says whoever gives dua an act of worship to other than Allah, it's something that is tiny. Then he is from those that are not successful kuffar disbelievers. Allah judged him to be a kafir. Is that clear? See the evidence how it ties up to whoever gives any portion of worship to other than Allah, then he is a kafir. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla He says those people that call upon other than Allah that they will not be successful because Allah will not give success to the kuffar he, he, he declared them to be kuffar then he starts mention, mentioning and this is the last part for this principle he starts mentioning the evidence for each act of worship that he mentioned and due to time we're just going to mention the, um, the evidence quickly without going into detail with each act of worship is that clear? so it's the same 14 he's just mentioning the evidences for each one and due to time we can't go into detail so he first says الدُّعَاءُ مُخُّ الْعِبَادَةِ الدُّعَاءُ is the core of worship. And this hadith is weak, but there is another hadith that is strong that says الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ That dua is worship. And the meaning of this is that dua is the pinnacle and the head of all of the acts of worship. The greatest of the acts of worship and the pinnacle and the best of them is الدُّعَاءُ just like the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Al-Hajju Arafa. The whole of Hajj is Arafa. But in Hajj, we don't have just Arafa, we have to go to 
to Kaaba, we have to go to Mina, we have to go to Muzdalifa, we have to go to other places. But Arafah is the pinnacle and one of the main pillars of Hajj. Whoever misses out on Arafah, what happens? He has no Hajj. Whoever misses out on Arafah, he has no Hajj. And the one, likewise, who gives away the greatest act of worship, Dua, and the head of it and the pinnacle, then he has no share of Islam, the one who gives Dua to other than Allah. Then he mentions the evidence is for Dua. Allah, the evidence is the statement of Allah Azawajal. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah Azawajal, he says, and your Lord Azawajal, he says, أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call upon me, I will accept your supplication. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Those that feel too arrogant, too proud to call upon Allah, to make dua to Allah, to make supplication to Allah, if they do that and they're too arrogant, that prevents them from making dua, then Allah Azawajal, he says, سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ They will enter the hellfire. Uh, in humiliation. So that's a dua. The second is al khawf. And al khawf, the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, the evidence for it is the statement of Allah, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not fear them, but fear me if indeed you are true believers. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, He did ta'liq of a person truly being a mu'min and a believer in him fearing Allah and not fearing other than Allah Azza wa Jal. And obviously, um, each, each act of worship has some details, but time doesn't allow us to go into detail. And so I'll give you a quick example, and you can use that same analogy for the rest of the acts of worship, or most of them. Fear of Allah Azza wa Jal that we're talking about is the fear that is worship. The fear that is worship. Some people, they fear, for example, I'll give you an example. We fear Allah Azza wa Jal, and we fear his punishment. Some people, they fear a dead person in their grave, someone who has passed away. They fear that if they, for example, um, don't give that dead person some money, or they don't give that dead person's family money and respect, they fear that that dead person will harm him. They fear that a dead person will harm him. So what, is, what does he do? Because he's fearful of this dead person in the grave, people told him if you don't give money to him or you don't respect his family, he's going to curse you or he's going to give you bad luck or you're not going to get children because of him. So he fears him and he starts giving money to him or to his family members or he starts doing things because of this fear of this dead person. This fear is shit. This fear is a fear of worship, shit. The fear that leads you to humiliation and dhul to other than Allah. As for natural fear, Al-Khawf al-Tabir, that a person fears a lion, a lion comes in. Which one of us is not going to be scared? Except for the one that's lying to himself. If that fear is, is it shit? He's fearing the lion, is that shit? No, that's a natural fear, that's allowed. We're not talking about that fear. The natural fear of someone that's stronger than you, he's going to beat you up. That's a natural fear. We're not talking about that fear. We're talking about fear that is worship and fear that is that carries you to dhul and khubur to other than Allah, to humiliation and, 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 and humiliation and humbleness to other than Allah. There is a third type of khawf which is haram, which is that you fear someone and that fear of someone makes you do something that is haram or makes you leave something that is um, wajib. And that is muharram, it's not shirk but it's haram. So there's someone bigger than you and he tells you, um, drink alcohol, right? And you just, he, he's not gonna beat you up for real, but you're just scared of him so you drink alcohol. He made you do something haram. Um, or you say, um, my, my worker, the, the, my employee at work, he said he's gonna fire me if I don't shave my beard. And because of your fear of getting fired, you shave your beard. Is this shit? It's not shit, it's haram. He made you fall into haram. So you, you're, not, you're supposed to say, my religion comes first, and you're discriminating, you're, you're discriminating my religious rights, or whatever you need to say, to stay. And if he doesn't budge, and he tells you, no, either you cut your beard, or I'm gonna terminate your contract, or your job. Then, khalas, akhi. The Prophet he said, man talaka shayam lillah, awadahullahu khayram bin. That whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, because you couldn't grow your beard, or wear your hijab, or the likes, or pray in a prayer place, you leave that jump for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you something better. 
But if you were to stay and you are fearing him and you left the salah or you left the beard, uh, growing the beard, then this is haram. So these three categories can go also into the different acts of worship that we're going to mention. Like, uh, so fear that is worship. Fear that is worship. Number two, fear that is natural. And fear that leads you to haram. It's not shit, but it makes you do something that's haram or leave alone something that's not finished. Then we have, after it, we have after it, we have الرجاء uh, and hope. And the evidence for that is فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Whoever hopes in the meeting of his Lord, then let him act righteous deeds and do not associate any uh, and he does not associate with the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal with anyone and anything and he doesn't perform shirk so this hope basically means it's the hope when you perform a good deed and you hope for the reward the Prophet Sallallahu he said مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ وَمَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا Whoever prays or uh, stands the night of Ramadan, in the night of Ramadan, iman with firm belief and ihtisab. You seek the reward. You hope for the reward. And the person who fasts in the month of Ramadan and he does it with firm belief and hoping for the reward, seeking the reward, then all of his previous sins will be removed. So you perform a righteous deed and you hope for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you fell into some sins. So you made tawbah. You, you t return and you made tawbah to Allah Azza wa repentance to Allah Azza wa Jal, and you hope that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts your repentance. You saw forgiveness and you hope Allah Azza wa Jal forgives you. This hope is the hope that we're talking about. As for the fake hope, which is a person, he's upon sin, upon haram, and he hopes he's gonna go to Jannah, but he doesn't perform any actions, and this is a ghurur, that he's only fooling himself. Person that thinks Allah will forgive, hopes that he will forgive him, but he doesn't seek forgiveness, he doesn't work righteous deeds, and he thinks that he's going to be in the Jannah al firdos the highest of Jannah al firdos when he's upon haram, and he doesn't do any righteous deeds. This hope is ghurur. This hope, the correct hope, has to have action connected to it. It has to have action coupled with it. The next act of worship he mentioned is at tawakkul which is to uh, have reliance upon Allah and the evidence is وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُ وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And upon Allah, make your reliance and put your trust in if you are truly believers. And the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever puts their trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, then he will suffice him. The next um, three acts of worship is الرَّغْبَ وَالرَّهْبَ وَالْخُشُورُ الرَّغْبَ is that you um, that you hope to reach something that is beloved to you. And this is a different type from, from the normal hope. Al-Rahba. And Al-Rahba is a khawf, is a fear. Al-Khawf al-Muthmiru lil-Harabi min al-Makhouf fahuwa khawf al-Makhroon bi-Amal. It is fear that leads you to run away from the thing that you are fearing. So you fear Allah Azza wa Jal and His punishment. So you perform actions that will remove you away from that punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal and the anger of Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's fear coupled with action again. Fear coupled with action. Maqroonun bi'amal. Then we have al-khushur. Al-khushur is a person that is humble and hum humiliated to, 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 because of the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. He's humble and humiliated because of the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he submits himself to the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the evidence is for all three is a statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla when he's talking about some of the prophets that came before. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَ نَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ They used to hasten to perform righteous deeds and they used to call us. They used to call Allah Azza wa Jalla. How? They used to call us رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا in hope and in fear. وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ And that they had khashya as well. The ulama, they mentioned the relationship between hope, fear, and uh, uh, love. They say that 
a mu'min, one second, they say hope and fear in a mu'min is like the two wings of a bird. One of the wings is hope, one of the other wings is fear. They have to be balanced. You can't have too much hope and you forget about fear. So you just hope in Jannah, hope in this, hope in that, and you think, so you say, I'm going to do sins, and Allah Azza wa forgives all sins. I'm going to do sins, and I'm going to do Hajj when I'm 50 years old, and Allah will forgive all of my sins. As long as I don't fall into shirk, eventually I will go to Jannah. So you rely upon hope only, and you forget at the same time that Allah Azza wa He punishes those people that disobey Him. He punishes those people that drink alcohol. He punishes, He punishes, He punishes those people that don't pray. And the opposite side is, the opposite is true. A person shouldn't have too much fear and he forgets about hope. So a person, he has so much fear of the punishment of Allah, so much fear of the, 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 um, the hellfire and the anger of Allah Azzawajal, that he forgets that Allah is the most merciful. So he despairs. He says, I'm destroyed. I've done so much sins, Allah will never forgive me because he has too much hope. And so he says, Allah will never forgive me, I give up, I am uh, despair, he might even commit suicide, he might even hang himself. Why? Because he had too much fear. You have to be balanced, you have to have hope and fear. Hope and fear like a bird, and the head of the bird is the love of Allah Azza wa Jal, which carries you to do good deeds and to seek the akhirah and the likes. Is that clear? They also mention in Bab al-Fa'idah, out of benefit, that there are maybe specific times where you have more hope, and specific times where you have more fear, specific times. So they say, for example, a person who is upon sin a lot, he should increase his hope so that he does not despair and he seeks forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal. Or if he's um, a person that relies too much upon the mercy, he should increase his fear so that he doesn't rely upon mercy too much, so he stops doing sins. He remembers that Allah Azza wa Jal takes account Allah Azza wa Jal Will, there will be a day of judgment. Allah will speak to every slave and the likes. So this fear causes him to lead to sins. And then there are, for example, another time where you increase your hope when you're about to die. A person, when he's on his deathbed and, this, and he's about to die, they say it's better to increase in hope and that you remind him of the good things, the good actions he used to do. So he can have raja and hope in meeting Allah. Allah, the Prophet he said, من أحب لقاء الله أحب الله لقاءه ومن كره لقاء الله كره الله لقاءه Whoever loves to meet Allah Azza wa Jal then Allah Azza wa Jal loves to meet him This time of death, you're in the time of death and you want to meet Allah Azza wa Jal, you're looking forward to it and Allah Azza wa Jal is looking forward to and, and to meeting him and a person who can had dislikes and hates to meet Allah in that position then Allah Azza wa Jalla hates to dislike him, uh, hates to uh, meet him as well. And so a person should increase in hope, and if there's someone from your family members, you should remind them, look, you are upon La ilaha illallah, you are upon Tawheed, Alhamdulillah, you used to pray all the salawat in jama'ah, jum'ah, in the masjid, and you used to fast. Remind the good so you can have hope for the reward of Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is, times, this is a time when you increase hope over fear. So there are times where this is over that one, but generally speaking, the rule is, should be balanced like a bird. If one of them is more than the other, the bird can't fly with one wing. وَهَكَذَا طيب. We'll read quickly the other acts of worship with the evidence of al khashya which is fear of Allah Azza wa Jal with knowledge. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Indeed, those that truly fear Allah Azza wa Jal are the scholars because they have knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. They say, مَنْ كَانَ لِلَّهِ أَعْرَفْ كَانَ لِلَّهِ أَخْوَفْ The more a person has knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal and his names and his attributes, the more he fears him. How can you fear someone that you do not know? And so, for that reason, khashya is a high level of act of worship. It's khashya that the scholars have. The scholars, when they hear the Qur'an being recited, you see them crying. The reason why they're crying is because they understand the speech of Allah Azza that's being read. They understand maybe where it was revealed, what situation and difficulty maybe the Prophets were going through. They understand the Sunnah of the Prophet and how to apply it correctly. So this khashya is a high level of worship that is coupled with knowledge. Then we have Al-Inabad, a person returns back to Allah Azza in Tawbah. 
So before that, فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ مُخْشَوْنِي Do not have khashya of anyone uh, of them, but have khashya of me. Then the next one is إِنَابَ Allah is already says وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهْ Return back to your Lord and submit to Him. So you return back to Allah is already in submission and you turn away from sins. The next act of worship is الْإِسْتِعَانَ Seeking aid with Allah. And the seeking aid of, of Allah is already that we're talking about is um, that which only Allah Azza wa Jal can do, that the rest can't do, and so and, and you're in a time of affliction. And so this, if you seek aid from other than Allah in such a situation, it becomes shirk. But if a person seeks assistance from Madani, I say for example, that pen you have, can you assist me with that pen, or can you assist me with lifting the table? Is it shirk? But I sought assistance with other than Allah. طيب, this is when it's allowed. If a person is in front of you, he's alive, he is able, and حَيٌّ قَادِرٌ وَحَيٌّ حَاضِرٌ وَقَادِرٌ Now, he is alive, he is present, and he is able. So he is in front of me, and he is able to give me that pen, or assist me with the, the lifting the table, and he is alive. I'm allowed to seek assistance from him, and this is not shit. We're talking about a time where someone is not hadir, someone is not hay, or someone who is not qadir, they seek assistance from them. So you say to, for example, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he died, right? Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he died, yeah? I say, oh Abu Bakr, help me lift the table. It is allowed. Why? Why? I give this kids a chance. Yeah. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, is he in UK? Is he in Coventry? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? You know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? Okay, you don't have us. Tayyip, Tayyip, someone else. Tayyip, what's the question? These brothers on the wall. He's not alive. He's not alive. He cannot help you, he cannot help himself. So he can't help you in that order. If you seek assistance from him, it's shirk. And the same goes for istighatha, when you seek assistance in times of hardship, and the same goes for seeking refuge. You can seek refuge with someone that's alive. I come to a village, and I have a lot of enemies in this village. I know the head of this village, I say to the head of the village, can you give me refuge in this village? He is alive, he is present, and he is able to help me then that seek refuge is not shirk. But if I go to a village and I say to the jinn, Oh jinn, I seek refuge in you jinn from any harm. Shirk, because they're not, they're not present in front of you like this. It's not like a human being. So it's shirk to ask, and that's what they used to do. That's what they used to do. And the kuffar of Quraysh, they used to seek aid with the and refuge with the jinn. So all of these three things, isti'ana, isti'ala, and isti'atha, they are not allowed and if, if for a person who is not able, who is not present, and who is not alive. If they are able, present, and alive, then you can seek assistance with them and refuge with them, and that's not shirk. And he mentions the evidences, and I seek refuge in the Lord of the Falaq, and I seek refuge in the Lord of the people. Then he mentions the delil of isti'atha, which is seeking assistance in times of hardship. He says, "It is the reason of Abbaqin Fastajabalakum when you saw assistance in the time of difficulty and with your Lord and your Lord is the Jabalakum. He accepted it from you and he answered your call. And last, or second to last, Al Dabh. Tay Afan, Istiana, we forgot to say the evidence. The evidence for seeking assistance is Iyya can Abud wa Iyya can Istain to you alone. We worship, or to you, to you alone we worship, and to you alone we seek assistance. And in the Sunnah, so this is the first time he mentions a hadith in the Sunnah, or the second time, Afwan, he says, If you seek aid, seek aid with Allah. Even, even in those things where it's allowed for you to seek assistance with someone who is able, present, and alive, it is better, it is better to not seek assistance with the people. It's allowed, but it's better not to. The Prophet ﷺ, he made bay'ah with some of his companions, and then later, some of his specific companions, Abu Bakr and a couple others, he made bay'ah with them again. 
And he added, Allah tas'alu nasa shay'a, that you do not ask anyone for anything. To the extent that Abu Bakr as Siddiq would be on a riding beast. And a riding beast is high, it's like, let's say it's this high. If I have a pen, and I'm this high, sitting on a horse, and the pen falls down, and the brother is, he's right there, he's, he's standing next to me, he's not on a riding beast. What's easier? For me to get up to get the pen, or just to say, Muhammad, give me the pen. To give me the pen, right? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq would not ask even to that extent because he made bay'ah to the Prophet that he would not ask anyone for anything to the point that he dropped something from his horse, he got up from his horse, and he picked it up himself, and he went back on his horse. Why? Seeking yani, um, complete reliance upon Allah Azawajal alone and Yani ta'affuf min nas being free of being in need of the people. This is a high level. It's not something that everyone does and everyone can do, but it's something that the Prophet will encourage that you do not ask anyone, and that's the better thing to do if you're able to. If you're able to uh, wash your own dishes instead of asking your mom to do it or your wife, then do it. Well, obviously, if you don't have to ask, there's something else. Anzahanak. <laughs> Adab is to slaughter, and slaughtering is only for Allah Azza wa Jal. The slaughter of an animal is only for Allah. So if a person is to slaughter to anyone besides Allah, whether it's a jinn, whether it's a human being, then it is shirk, and it is, um, it's not allowed. And that the evidence for that is, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَاي وَنَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ Say that my prayer, that my nusuk, Nusuk is your slaughtering. And my life and my death is Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. It's for Allah alone, the Lord of the world. La sharika la. There is no partners and there is no associates with Him. And from the Sunnah, Allahu man May the curse of Allah be upon someone who does dabh and slaughters to other than Allah. طيب. Then he mentions another vowing and um, making an oath and so you, you can't make and, 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 and a vow is that you say is that you make obligatory upon yourself something that is not obligatory so if you say I make a vow to pray two rak'ahs in Masjid and Nabawi it's not obligatory upon us to pray in Masjid and Nabawi right? so obligatory is to make Hajj to Mecca but not to Medina it's not obligatory to go pray in Masjid and Nabawi but if a person says, I made it obligatory upon myself, I made a vow to pray two rak'ahs in Medina, Masjid al nabawi or Masjid Quba, then you made it obligatory upon yourself. And now you have to fulfill your vow. And this vow that you made, you're not allowed to make that vow by other, you can't say by Allah, uh, sorry, you can say by Allah, I'm going to pray two rak'ahs in Masjid al nabawi or Masjid Quba. You cannot say by uh, by Abdul Qadir Jilani, or by my grandfather, or by my dog, I'm going to pray to Rakhash Mishnah. You're making a qasam and a vow by using other than the name of Allah. <laughs> this vow has to be for Allah alone, and you have to fulfill it unless you see something uh, better than the option. Then you do kafara, you do expiation of that vow. The evidence for it is يُوفُونَ بِالنَّدْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ الْيَوْمٍ كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا They fulfill their vows. They will fulfill their vows and they will fear a day that يَوْمَ كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا That is evil as well as bread. Thank you. استمر ولا نعجل للدورة قادرة؟ ها؟ طيب. So um, when the next, so that's the first question done. Mar Rabbuk is finished now. So Mar Rabbuk, in this book, he mentioned first of all who is our Lord. How did you come to know your Lord? Some examples of worship. And then he mentioned that anyone that gives any of these examples of worship to other than Allah, then it's falling to shirk. And lastly, the evidence is for each of these acts of worship. And obviously the acts of worship are not specific to these 14 only. There is more than these. Fasting wasn't mentioned, but fasting is an act of worship. Zakat is an act of worship. Charity is an act of worship. Good man is an act of worship. So you can have, there's many more actions of worship. 
I just mentioned a few of the main ones. So that's the first question. Man Rabbuk finished. Second question. Ma Dinuk, what is your religion? And we're gonna speed it up because we've already been going on for almost two hours. And so forgive me if the shah and the explanation of the book this hasn't been given as due right. But because of the time, we'll, we'll just mention it quickly, inshallah. The second point is Ma'rifatul Islam bin Adillah. Knowing this religion, having knowledge of this religion with its proofs. And its religion is al Islam. It's not peace. Some people say Islam is peace. And that's it. That's a deficient definition. No. Well, Islam means uh, su submission. Ahsan. So Islam doesn't mean peace alone. The word salam is in the root word. It comes in, it's got the same root word. But that's not the meaning of Islam. Islam is al Islam lillahi bi tawheed wal inqiyadu lahu bi ta'ah wal bara'atu min al wa ahlihi. Islam is that you submit yourself by way of Tawheed. Submit yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal, al Islam lillah, that you submit yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal by way of Tawheed. Wal inqiyadu lahu bi ta'ah, that you yield to him through obedience. And lastly, al bara'atu min al shirk wa ahlihi, that you free yourself from shirk and its people. And we already talked about how you free yourself from shirk and its people by not participating with them in their festivals and their shirkiyat and the likes. Tayyip. So, is this Islam lillahi bi tawheed, submitting to Allah Azza wa Jal by way of tawheed, yielding to Him through obedience, and lastly, freeing yourself from shirk and its people. Then the author he says, Wa huwa thalatu maratib. Islam has three levels. And these three levels are number one, al Islam, number two, al Iman, and number three, al Ihsan. And they have these levels, they have darajas, they, they, one is higher than the other. So the base is al Islam. And then a bit higher than that is Iman. Then a bit higher than that is Ihsan. Ihsan is the highest level. Not everyone reaches al Ihsan, may Allah Azza make us. Reach al Ihsan. And some of the scholars they say it's like three dawa'il, three. Imagine you have three main circles. A big circle, that big circle is al Islam. Everyone that says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, and upholds its pillars, is a Muslim. Then we have al Iman, which is a smaller circle. So we have the big circle, and inside that big circle we have a smaller circle. And that circle is Iman. And that's the one that later his Islam has been firm and, and steadfast and he upholds the obligation and stays, stays away from the Muharramat. This is higher than just the Islam. Then we have an even smaller circle which is Ihsan. Ihsan. So we have the big circle Islam, a smaller circle inside the Iman and a smaller circle inside there which is Ihsan. Which is that, I'm going to mention that in detail and that is the highest level. Then he mentions the first one. Sorry, he mentions كل مرتبة لها كان. Each of these levels has pillars. So, how many pillars does Islam have? Five. How many pillars does Iman have? Six. How many pillars does Ihsan have? Seven. لا. One. One. One pillar. So he meant he's, now he's going to mention in this pillar or in this question. The second question, what is your religion? He's going to talk about Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, and each of its pillars. But because of time, we can't go into the explanation in detail. So the first one is Al-Islam. Al-Islam has five pillars as we, sweat, as we said, and everyone knows the five pillars. Al-Shahadatayn, the two shahadas, then Al-Salah, then Al-Zakah, then Fasting, then Hajj. The first of those pillars is Al-Shahadah. To bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah, and that to bear witness that Muhammad is the slave and messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. Then he mentions what is the evidence for the first pillar of shahada What is the evidence for the first pillar of shahada He says, Shahid Allah anahu la ilaha illa hu wal malaikatu wa ulu al-ilm qa'iman bil qisq la ilaha illa hu al-aziz al-hakim He says, Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal has borne, has, has bared witness that none has the right to be worshipped except for him. 
وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ And likewise the angels and the people of knowledge have also bear, bore witness to none, being the, none ha having the right to be worshipped except for Allah جل, meaning La ilaha illallah Bil this injustice, they all bore witness in this injustice and it's not oppression, this is the haq and truth La ilaha illahu al aziz al hakim None has the right to be worshipped except for him Al aziz al hakim The mighty and the wise Now he mentions what is the meaning of La ilaha illallah طيب. Let's uh, let's get some engagement. What does La ilaha illallah mean? Islamic or just uh, Islam? La ilaha illallah. Uh, ah, it means there's no one to be worshipped except Allah. Do you know the Arabic? Ah, uh, what is La ilaha illallah? What is it? La ma'abuda bi haqqin. La ma'abuda bi haqqin illa Allah. So they say La ilaha illallah. The tafsir of it is La ma'abuda bi haqqin illa Allah. None has the right to be worshipped in truth except for Allah Azza wa Jalla. No one deserves to be worshipped in truth except for Allah Azza wa Jalla. And that is the correct meaning of La ilaha illallah. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions that there are other deities, other gods. Because why is a god? Why is a god? Tony creates. Yeah, yes, yes. Only Allah creates. Yeah, huh? Objects of worship. Objects of worship, something that is worshipped. If someone worships this water, he made this a god, right? Because somebody worshipped it. Someone worships, some people worship fire. Some people worship the sun. These things are gods for them. But what's the difference? Are they true gods or false gods? That's the point. They are false gods. So some people that say, La ilaha illallah means there's no god but Allah. It's not the right meaning because there are other gods. It's not only one. There's one true God, but there are many false gods. So La ilaha illallah means none has the right to be worshipped. So imagine there's ten gods. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, none has the right to be worshipped, negates all of them. All of those ten, none of them deserve to be worshipped. Illallah. Except for Allah Azza wa Jalla. So these other gods, they do exist, but they do not deserve to be worshipped. لا معبود بحق إلا الله. Then he says, after he said ومعناها لا معبود بحق إلا الله لا إله ما في جميع ما يعبد من دون الله إلا الله في تلبادة لله وحده لا شريك له في عبادته كما أنه لا شريك له في ملكه وتفسيرها الذي يوضحها قوله تعالى قال إبراهيم لأبيه وقومه إنني براء مما تعبدون إلا الذي فطرني فإنه سيفي وَجَعَلَهَا كَلِمَةً بَاقِيَةً فِي عَقِبِهِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ He says the meaning of it that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except for Allah. Then he mentions two pillars in La ilaha illallah. Negation and affirmation. Negating that none has the right to be worshipped. You negate all things that are worshipped. And then you affirm that only Allah Azawajal deserves to be worshipped. Negation and affirmation. And Allah Azawajal mentions this in many places throughout the Quran. And from the evidences is وَتَفْسِرُهَا الَّذِي Before that it says إِلَّا اللَّهُ مُثْبِتَ لَبَعْزِ اللَّهُ وَحَدُهُ لَا شَرِكَ لَهُمْ طيب مفهوم واضح وَتَفْسِرُهَا الَّذِي يُوَضِّبُهَا The evidence that clarifies that is the statement where Ibrahim عليه السلام he says he said to his father and he said to his people Ibrahim عليه السلام what is he? See our next door neighbor who is Ibrahim? Prophet عليه السلام. لا فاضل إسلام بو. يعني to say فاضل يعني he had great station in Turkey, the father of most of the prophets or the rest of the prophets and messengers that came after him. إبراهيم عليه السلام. his father was what? أحسن. he was an idol worshiper. بل they say that إبراهيم's father, the the people in his time they used to worship idols. Made out that look like the sun and the moon and the stars, right? And they say that he was from the best of the people that used to shape those idols that looked like specific um, stars and moons and planets and the likes. And they say even the shapes of angels. He used to make them. Ibrahim's father, and Allah Azza guided his son to a tawhid, and he became from the best of the prophets. He was from the best five prophets, Ulul Azim. That's how great Ibrahim was, but look, his father was a mushrik. 
And so, Allah Azza wa mentions the story how Ibrahim said to his father and said to his people, he said, Innani bala'un mimma ta'budun. Indeed, I am free from that which you worship. Except for the one who created me and nurtured me, for indeed he will guide me aright. And he made this a kalima that is baqiya, a, a statement that stuck with his the offspring. La ilaha illa something that stuck with his offspring. La allahum yarjoon, so that they may return back to it. Then he mentions another evidence. He says. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالُوا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْءٍ وَلَا يَتَّخِلَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ تَوَلُّوا فَقُولُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ He says, say, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, say, يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ All people of the book, the people of the book are who? The Jews and the Christian. They are referred to as the people of the book. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, say, O oh people of the book, Ta'ala, come. Come to what? Come to a kalimah, a word, a statement. Sawa in baynana wa baynakum. That we can come into agreement between us and you. Alla na'buda illallah wa la nushrika bihi shay'a. This statement is that we do not worship anyone besides Allah Azza wa Jal. And that we, we, we do not worship anyone besides Allah Azza wa Jal and we do not set up and associate any partners with Him. Meaning, La ilaha illallah. O people of the book, O Jews, O Christians, come to this just word of La ilaha illallah. No fake deities, no false deities, not Isa being the Son of God, no Trinity, not worshipping Mary, not worshipping a creation like ourselves, but we worship the creator of the creation. We free the people from servitude to creation and we, we connect them to the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do not take ourselves one another as arbab besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they do not accept فَإِن تَوَلَّوا they turn away from you, they do not accept فَقُلْ فَقُولُوا اِشْهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ then say, bear witness that we are indeed believers the difference between the believers and those people of the book is that they turned away from singling out Allah Azza wa Jal in his Tawheed and La ilaha illallah. طيب, so that's the first pillar, the Shahadatin. The second, sorry, that's the first part, first section of the first pillar. Because the first pillar is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. So the second part that we bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Messenger of Allah, the evidence for it is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتْتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَغُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah Azza wa Jal verily has sent to you a messenger from amongst yourself. He was a human being, he was not an angel, he was not jinn. From amongst yourself. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتْتُمْ It is heavy upon him and difficult upon him. What difficulties that comes to you? The Prophet used to feel sad when something would harm his ummah and his nation. Harisun alaykum, and he would strive for their goodness. Bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim, and he would be awfully merciful and extremely merciful to the believers. So that's the evidence that Muhammad was sent by Allah in the Quran. Like what, does, what does believing and testifying that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah mean? What does it entail? It entails four things. تصديقه فيما أمر تصديقه فيما أمر تصديقه فيما أمر أعفوا طاعته فيما أمر وتصديقه فيما أخبر واجتناب ما نهى عنه وزجر وألا يعبد الله إلا بما شرع Four things number one that you obey his commandments that you obey his commandments the Prophet ﷺ told us to pray like this in this specific way, we pray like the Prophet ﷺ prayed. We fast like the Prophet ﷺ fasted. Every commandment he told us to do, we do. And we affirm and we believe and testify to everything he has told us. From the akhbar, from the things that happened in the past, from the things that happened in the time of the Prophet 
and the things that he mentioned in the future is going to take place. We believe and testify to the truthfulness of that. When the Prophet tells us the story of the three men that were locked in a cave and they asked Allah by their righteous deeds to open up the cave and each one asked and then they came out of the cave and believe in that story and that came before the Ummah of Muhammad and We believe in the things that happened in the time of the Prophet like the splitting of the moon. We believe in it even though we never saw it. And those people that reject it, there is, yani, from the kuffar and disbelievers, there is many proofs against them. First of all, Allah Azza mentioned it in the Quran. Secondly, they say, how come no one saw it apart from the people of Mecca? Then we say to them, there are people that saw it outside of Mecca. We have the story of a king in India who had a kingdom. And at night time, he was on his balcony with his wife. And he happened to see the moon split into two. And so he was amazed by what's going on. So he asked the people and they said, there is a messenger that has come out in the Arabian Peninsula. And so he became a Muslim and he traveled to the Prophet This has been written down and this man, his offspring lived till today in India. And he, he established the first masjid in India and that masjid still exists. And his offspring, some of them, they're not Muslims, they're Bhuvi or whatever. And they still say, we are proud of our grandfather. We, it's true, yeah, and they don't reject the story. So, this is yani, that someone outside of Mecca saw it. And, uh, and there is other um, proofs like there is a manuscript in Persia, manuscripts like old writings or paintings. There's a painting which shows some people's heads, all of them looking up, and there is a face that's split in half. The face up in the sky is the moon split in half. This was found in Persia, and this manuscript is found in Spain at the time, same time of the Prophet. And so this is something the Prophet happened in his time, we believe in it even though we never saw it. And some things in the future uh, that the Prophet told us about that, that have taken place or are still yet to take place, we believe in the truthful nature of them. Uh, uh, and also NASA uh, research about the moon has like calves. Calves. Okay, the brother says NASA they found calves of the moon being split. Yeah. Yani, even if we never had that, but well, just yani, taqeed and emphasis upon the point. So the first is we obey his commandments. The second is we testify to the truthfulness of everything he has told us. Thirdly, we stay away from everything the Prophet ﷺ prohibited and he made haram. The Prophet ﷺ told us stay away from khamr, stay away from khamr and the likes. And lastly, we do not worship Allah except with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We do not make up a new way to worship Allah. We only worship Allah the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us to worship. So that's what bearing witness to the truth um, that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah means. You follow his commandments, stay away from the prohibitions, believe in everything he told us from the past and the future, and that you worship Allah in the way that he told us, and not by making up innovations. So that's the first pillar of Islam. The second pillar of Islam is as salah. He mentions quickly, he mentions, and we all know what as salah is the prayer, there's no need to mention. And it's something that's clear to try to clarify even more. Everyone knows what salah is. And everyone knows what zakah is. Zakah is to give charity that is obligatory upon people that have money that reach a specific threshold. If they reach this amount, then they have to give zakah to the poor people. Allah he mentions these two in, the, in one verse. Allah he says, Allah he says, and they were not commanded except to worship Allah Azza wa Jal sincerely to him, as making the religion sincerely to him, and that they establish the prayer and that they give the zakah. So here we have proof for tawheed and we have proof for salah and we have proof for zakah. That is the upright religion. So that's the evidence for salah and zakah. Then he mentions the fourth pillar, which is siyam, fasting. The evidence for that is the statement of Allah Azza in Surah Al-Baqarah يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed and made obligatory upon you, our nation, just like it was prescribed on those that came before you. Fasting was not something that was specific to our Ummah. The people that came before, it was obligatory upon them as well. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain taqwa. So that's the evidence for fasting. Lastly, Al-Hajj. The evidence for 
um, performing Hajj in the Quran is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ so Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Allah has a right due upon the people to perform Hajj to his house for whoever has the ability and the means. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ and whoever disbelieves in that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ that Allah Azza wa Jal is free from the alameen. Okay, quick question. These are the five pillars of Islam. What is the qadr? What is the amount that is included as a pillar from the prayers and fasting and hajj? Is it every type of prayer is obligatory upon us or is it specific types of praying, the specific type of fasting, is there a specific type of hajj? Uh, specific, yeah. Specific type of prayers and... Like specific type of prayers, which prayers? My prayer? Uh, the five daily prayers. The five daily prayers, they are a pillar from the pillars of Islam. What about the night prayer? Is that a pillar? It's not a pillar. It's a very great act of worship. It's one and shudu. It's not a pillar. The Prophet Sallallahu he would encourage us to pray in the night. And the Sahaba and the ulama that came after, they would say that a person who doesn't pray in the night, then he's a bad person. And a person that doesn't pray in the night, we don't accept his witness statement. If he makes witness of something, we don't accept it if he doesn't pray at night. Even if it's one or three rakahs. So, it's a great act of worship, but it's not a pillar from the pillars of Islam. Tayyip, what is the point that is um, a pillar from fasting? If I fast Mondays and Thursdays, is that a pillar? What is the pillar? Fasting the month of Ramadan. Fasting the month of Ramadan is the pillar of Islam. And the same is for Hajj. Hajj, the pillar is that you perform Hajj to Islam. The first Hajj that you make, if you're able, is the pillar of Islam. If you've made Hajj, and then you make another Hajj, and a third Hajj, and a fourth Hajj, these are voluntary Hajj, but they don't enter into the five pillars of Islam. I hope that's clear. So the voluntary acts don't enter into these um, five pillars of Islam, even though they are great actions by themselves. So that's the first level of Islam and its five pillars. The second level is Iman. And Al-Iman, the ta'rif and definition of Iman is actions, speech, and the actions of the heart. Meaning, Iman entails these three things. The, 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 the actions of your heart, like hope, fear, love, Reliance upon Allah Azza wa Jal, Rahba, Rahba, all these th acts of worship that I mentioned, they all take place in the heart. Right? That is uh, one of the things that Iman entails. Number two, your statements with your tongues, reading Quran, doing dhikr, these things that you do with your tongue is part of Iman. And lastly, the actions of your limbs, that you pray, that you make sujood, that you make rukur, that you raise your hands to make dua, these are actions of the limbs. These three things is what Iman is. And it increases with obedience of al rahman and it decreases with the obedience of Shaytan. The more acts of worship that you perform, ibadah, then the more your Iman goes up and up and up. The more you pray, the more it goes up. The more you recite Quran, the more it goes up. And the opposite is true. The more you listen to Shaytan, the more you disobey Allah, the more it goes down. The more it goes down. So Iman increases and decreases. So if a person feels low in their iman, what's the reason? The reason is they need to perform righteous deeds. And they need to stay away from sins and make tawbah. So these are five things. Actions of your heart, the tongue and your limbs. It increases with obedience and it decreases with disobedience. And it has... Um, in this book he mentions a, um, a, a, a 70 odd branches. And in other narrations it says 60. It has 70 odd branches. Iman has 70 odd branches. The highest level of Iman is La ilaha illallah. The lowest level of Iman is that you remove something harmful from, harmful from the street and the road and the pathway. You see glass on the floor that's broken, that you move that glass is from the lowest part of Iman. Um, and anything else that is similar to it. And so if you see glass, 
Move it in the best of your ability. You get adjusted for it. That's part of your iman. It is um, is an action of the limbs. And lastly, al haya min al iman. Shyness is an act of iman. And yesterday you had the question of where is the proof in this hadith um, for the three things that iman entails: actions of the heart, actions of the tongue, and your limbs. Where is it in this hadith? And we answered it. We said, "Qawlu la ilaha illallah." That you say La ilaha illallah is with your tongue. That you remove something harmful from the road you, is action, is your limbs, you're using your limbs to remove something. And lastly, the heart, action of the heart is what? Al haya, shyness is in your heart. And so we have statement of the tongue, La ilaha illallah, actions of the limbs, removing something harmful, and the action of the heart, which is haya. This is in the hadith of the Prophet. Its pillars is six, as we mentioned. أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر وتؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره. You believe in Allah. That you believe in the angels. That you believe in His books. That you believe in His messengers. That you believe in the last day. That you believe in the قدر, the good of it and the bad of it. And these six pillars of iman are immense in the life of a Muslim. And if we were just to take those six pillars alone, we could do a whole day just explaining those six pillars. And there are some scholars who have. Um, spent volumes of, of pages and books explaining these six pillars of Iman because that's how great and, uh, uh, and important they are in Islam. طيب. But we can't go into detail because of time. طيب. We, can, we can mention what is the Qadr. Uh, we can't mention, we can't mention, there's more time. What is the evidence for these six pillars of Iman? The evidence for these six pillars of Iman is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. ليس البر أن تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين الله عز وجل he mentions in this verse in سورة البقرة the five of the six pillars of إيمان it is not from their righteousness that you تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب it is not from righteousness that you move your faces to the east and to the west but rather righteousness is that you believe in Allah, that you believe in the last day, that you believe in the angels, and that you believe in the kutub, the books, and that you believe in the prophets. Five of the six pillars. And then Allah says in another verse, and this is the evidence for Qadr, Allah he says, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi Qadr. Indeed, we have created everything with Qadr, with the pre decree. That's the sixth pillar of Iman. As I said, each one could be, you could do a less, separate lesson for each one, but time doesn't allow, and we'll continue. Like what we can mention though is, the ulama, they mentioned that Iman and Islam, the five pillars of Islam, five pillars of Iman have a relationship. MashaAllah, this masjid has good mannerisms, Allah MashaAllah. I haven't seen this in the UK before. It is from the mannerisms of a student and a person sitting in the majlis of Ilm, to put their hand up and to ask if they have to go outside maybe to the toilet or to leave that they put their hand up to seek permission to go and this is what the people do with our ulama in Medina and Mecca and the lands of the Muslims right? so inshallah, mashallah, Coventry they said the Baha'i inshallah the relationship between Islam and Iman and Islam and Iman they have a relationship where if both of them are mentioned, they have separate meanings, and if one of them is mentioned, it entails both meanings. Meaning, if we only mention Iman by itself in an ayah or a hadith, then it means the whole of the religion of Islam, including the pillar, five pillars of Islam, including the five pillars of Iman. And if we, likewise, if we use Islam only, then it means the whole religion of Islam, including the five, six pillars of Iman. But if we mention both of them in one place, in one hadith, or in one verse, both of them are mentioned, Allah mentions Islam and Iman, then they have separate meanings. The separate meanings is, this one is, Islam is the outward actions. The five pillars of Islam is the outward actions. You're praying, you're doing zakah, you're fasting, you're doing hajj. These are outward actions. That's what Islam means if it's put together with Iman. And Iman means the inward actions. And the inward actions is belief. Belief in Allah, 
belief in the messengers, belief in the angels, all of these experiences of Iman are belief of the heart, the inward actions. So Islam and Iman are put together in one ayah or hadith, then they have separate meanings. This one means the outward actions from them, the five pillars of Islam. This one's inward actions from them, six pillars of Iman. Clear? Then he mentions the, had the evidence for, oh no, uh, we'll go to the, sorry, the third level. The third level is Al-Ihsan. And it has, who says seven pillars? I will fight, Islam is five pillars, Iman is six pillars, Ihsan seven pillars, yeah, makes sense. Ihsan has one pillar, and that pillar is Al Ta'bud Allah Ka'annaka Tara. Is that you worship Allah Azza wa Jal as if you can see Him. If you cannot reach that level of seeing Him, then at least that you worship Allah Azza wa Jal knowing that He sees you. So this is the pillar of Ihsan, which is that you worship Allah Azza wa Jal with excellence to the highest level. You're worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal as if you can see Him. So you perform your prayer, your salah, your zakah, your siyam, your seeking of knowledge to the highest degree. And if you can't reach that highest level, then at least that you feel and you know that Allah is watching you. And He is watching you. But that you act and, 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 and according to that, that Allah Azza is watching you. So you have khashya and khushu' in your salah. That you do things for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. That you do not show up and the likes. Tayyip, this is the pillar of... This is the pillar of Ihsan. This is the one pillar of Ihsan. Then he mentions the evidence for Ihsan and he says نعم المرتبط الثالث الإحسان ركن واحد وهو أن تعبد الله كما كترافع لم تكن ترافع إنه يراك and the evidence is استيمال الله عز وجل he mentions three evidences إن الله مع الذين اتقوا والذين هم محسنون indeed Allah عز وجل is with those that have taqwa piety والذين هم محسنون and those that have إحسان those that worship Allah عز وجل upon excellence the second evidence is وتوكل على العزيز الرحيم الذي يراك حين تقوم وتقلبك في الساجدين إنه هو السميع العليم Allah عز وجل he says put your trust in العزيز in in the mighty and the merciful الذي يراك حين تقوم the one who sees you when you stand up وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ And your rotations when you are making sujood إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Indeed, He is the one that is all-seeing, all all-knowing. And so here, it is Ihsan that you know Allah Azza wa Jal, He's seeing you when you get up and when you make making sujood and when you are doing these different acts of worship. Lastly is, the last evidence for Ihsan is وَمَا تَكُونُ فِي شَأْنٍ You will not be in any affair. وَمَا تَتْلُ مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنٍ and you do not recite any portion of Qur'an وَلَا تَعْمَلُونَ مِنْ عَمَلٍ And you do not perform any action إِلَّا except كُنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ شُهُودًا إِبْتُفِيرُونَ فِيهِ Except that Allah Azza wa Jal is a witness over you when you perform them. And so this is a evidence for Ihsan that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching you with every action that you do. طيب So we've taken Islam and its five pillars Iman and its six pillars Ihsan and its one pillar then he mentions a evidence from he mentions evidence from the Quran for each one. Now he mentions an evidence from the Sunnah that mentions all of those things that we mentioned. And that hadith is the hadith of Jibreel. The hadith when Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet and asked him, What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And this hadith is called Umm Sunnah, the head of the Sunnah, the mother of the Sunnah. Just like Surah Al-Fatiha is called Ummul Qur'an, the head of the whole of the Qur'an, the greatest chapter. Just like that, the greatest hadith is the hadith of Jibreel. And in it are many benefits, and we can't, uh, separate comforts can just be made in hadith Jibreel. But in short, Jibreel alayhi salam, he came, and he had clothes that were extremely white and clean. And his hair was extremely black, meaning he يعني, looked after himself and he was in his يعني, best form and he came with the best clothes and had a shower and got ready in the best form. Then he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he sat in front of him. فوضع يده, فوضع ركبته على ركبته. 
Wa He put his knees next to his knees, sat right next to him, and put his hands on the knees of the Prophet Sallallahu or uh, the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he asked him, Akhbirni an al-Islam. So here the ulama they say, in this little introduction of the hadith is in it the mannerisms of a student when it comes to the majalis, the circles of knowledge. This is a circle of knowledge. There are, there are mannerisms when you're coming to this circle. And from that is that you come with the best of your clothes, that you have a shower beforehand, that you look your best, and that you come with good adab, that you sit close to the majlis as possible, and that you ask if you have a teacher with yani, respect. You don't show as if you know everything with arrogance. Some people they will say, some people they will come, they will say, Yeah, Sheikh, uh, I already know that this means this and I've read five pages of this book and, and I just wanted to ask your opinion. Yeah, and he makes himself seem like he knows everything already, he already knows the answer, but I just want to know your opinion. That's not how you come with the teacher. You go to the teacher, even if you know that the, question, the answer to that question and you want to benefit, you, you show that you have had for this ilm. You show yourself as being humble. And this is what the ulama mentioned, and this is what Jibreel did. And so Jibreel uh, uh, he asked what is Islam, and the Prophet answered with the five pillars of Islam. Then he asked about Iman, and the Prophet answered with the six pillars of Iman. Then he asked about Ihsan, and he answered with the one pillar of Ihsan. So all of these things that the author brought, uh, sorry, the author mentioned in the book word by word is mentioned in this hadith word by word. So did he bring anything from his pocket? Did he bring a new sect called Wahhabiyyah? La, everything that he mentions, there's evidence for it. There's evidence for it. All he, all he is doing is taking from the Quran, making it easy for you, putting it categorization. This is one, two, three, here's the evidence. This is one, two, three, here's the evidence. He's just making it easy for you to take that knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah. طيب. Then he was asked about the signs of the hour, and he said, Mal Mas'ulu. He basically said that you and I, both of us, we do not have any knowledge of it. Yani the one that the one that's being asked does not know any more than the one that is asking. Meaning, no one knows when the hour is going to take place except for Allah. Something specific to the knowledge of Allah Azza Then he asked about some of the signs, and he gave some of its signs. At the end of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, "This is Jibril Alayhi Salam." When he left, he said, "You know who this man is?" He said, "No." And in some narrations in Sahih Muslim, without the metan, but the, um, the chain is there in Sahih Muslim, and the metan is in the Mustakhraj and other places, it mentions that Jibreel, he came in a form that the Prophet ﷺ didn't recognize. He came in the form of a man, of course. But it was one of the first times that the Prophet ﷺ didn't know who he was up until he left, and he realized it was Jibreel. And so he said to Umar, do you know who that was? And he said, I do not know. Allah 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 is much to know best. And he said that was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So this hadith encompasses your whole religion. And what was this question about? What are we learning right now? The second question of the grave. What is the second question of the grave about? What is your religion? And what did the, what did he teach you? He taught you Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and all of their pillars and explained a little bit of it. And what did the Prophet say about these three things? He said, Jibreel came you to teach you your religion. And what did Jibreel teach? He taught the same thing that Shaykh Muhammad al Hab is teaching you in this book. The same thing in the Sunnah of the Prophet that Jibreel came to teach you your whole religion. This is the answer of what is the religion that is brought in the book. So he never brought anything new. Tayyib. Now, so that's the second, that's the second um, question finished in the grave. The last question is, um, what's the time? The last is 20 minutes. Tayyib. Like, may Allah Azza accept it from us, may Allah Azza forgive us for our sins, may Allah Azza wa um, increase us in knowledge. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyibun wa amal mutaqabbala. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa' wa min qalbin la yakhshak wa min nasin la tashba' wa min du'an la yustajabu laha. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li walidina wa jami'a al-Muslimin. Allahumma aghzal islam al-Muslimin wa adil al-shirka wal-mushrikin wa adil al-adaka adal al-deen. Allahumma inna ka'afubun tuhibbu al-afu wa fa'fu anna. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-walimin. We haven't finished the book, I'm just mentioning some du'as because it's the last hour of Friday and the du'a made in the last hour of Friday is accepted.
طيب the author continues and he says الأصل الثالث the third principle the third question He says, the third question is مَعْرِفَةُ نَبِيِّكُمْ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ To have knowledge and acquaintance of your messenger, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So this question is where the angels, Munkar and Nakir, will ask you, who is this man that was sent to you? Meaning, who is this prophet that was sent to you? And he is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And so, the least that you need to know about Muhammad وسلم, is that his name is Muhammad. That's the least. It's not enough. a person cannot be Muslim if he doesn't know that there was a prophet sent to us called Muhammad وسلم, and he's the last of the messengers. So the least that enters into this is that you know his name and that you know that he was the last of the messengers and that you have to follow him and the likes. So he says. وَهُوَ مُحَمَّدٍ well, He gives you more than that now. He says, وَهُوَ مُحَمَّدٍ إِبْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ إِبْنِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِدِ إِبْنِ هَاشِمٍ وَهَاشِمٍ قُرَيْشٍ وَقُرَيْشٍ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ وَالْعَرَبِ مِنْ ذُرِّيَةِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِبْنِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْخَلِيلِ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَى نَبِيْنَا أَخْبَرُ الصلاة والسلام. He is, his name is Muhammad ibn عبد الله His father's name is عبد الله ibn عبد المطلد His grandfather's name is عبد المطلد ibn Hashim the son of Hashim. His great grandfather is called Hashim. So that's his full name. Muhammad ibn, ibn Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. These four. Ha. Who can repeat? The wall. Muhammad. Yeah. 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 Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib bin Hashim bin Mur. No, yeah, no, 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 so the tribe of the Prophet ﷺ goes back to Quraysh. <coughs> and Quraysh are from the Arab. <coughs> and the Arab, they come from the offspring of Ismail, the son of Ibrahim. Ismail السلام, and Ibrahim. السلام. So the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ goes back to Ismail ibn Ibrahim. وله من العمر ثلاث وستون سنة. He has his age and his lifespan was sixty three years old. Pay attention. Salam lesson. Bismillah. I Medina. We sit from Fajr for three hours. Then after Asr, we come back for another two hours. Then after Maghrib, another two hours. After Isha, another two hours. Then you wake up Fajr again. You have another three hour lesson for seven days straight. So this is Shana, it's Khafi. It's Khafi, it's Shana. It's only 2 hours 35 minutes. Tayyip? Inshallah, with practice comes to perfection this year. He said, the more you do this, the more you get used to it. So, be patient with us, Inshallah. His age, his lifespan was 63 years old. He lived for 63 years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi 40 years was before prophethood. 40 years he lived and he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a prophet for 40 years. And then Allah Azza wa sent down to him revelation and he became a prophet and he, and he relayed the message from Allah to the rest of mankind for 23 years. 40 plus 23 is 99. Give me a week. 63 years, 40 years before Islam, and 23 years as a prophet. He spent 13 years in Mecca. He spent 13 years in Mecca. And how many years in Medina? 10. 10. 10. Good at maths at school. 
Twenty-three years, thirteen years in Mecca, ten years in Medina. طيب. Those forty years he wasn't a prophet, but Allah Azza wa Jal chose him to be the best in mannerisms, the best in truthfulness, the best in in in, in um, being trustworthy. The people used to call him as sadiq al Amin before he was even a prophet. They used to call him the truthful, trustworthy person. Back in the day, they didn't have banks. If they had something expensive and they wanted to travel, they would leave it with someone who's trustworthy. Imagine a this big gold that cost, let's say, uh, I don't know, half a million pounds. They didn't want to leave it in their house because the house is empty. Maybe someone will rub it. So they would leave it as a wadi'a to someone who's trustworthy until they come back. So the people used to go to Muhammad وسلم, before prophethood, before he called to Tawheed, and they used to give it to him and place it in his house because they knew he was a trustworthy person. He's not going to rub it, he's not going to cheat them, he's not going to give it to someone else. And he was truthful. They never knew him to tell a lie. So Allah even protected him from shirk, protected him from the worship of other than Allah, protected him from swearing by other than Allah, protected him from drinking alcohol, protected him from fornication. Allah protected him from all of the haram things because he chose him for a major purpose and that was to be the messenger which he became at 40. And 40 was the age that the majority of the prophets and messengers of Islam would, would be uh, messengership and prophethood would be given to them. The first revelation that he was given was Iqra, read. So he was um, isolating himself in the cave of Hira when Jibreel came to him and grabbed him. Angel Jibreel came to him and grabbed him tightly in the hand and said to him, Iqra, read. And the Prophet was illiterate. He couldn't read nor write. And so he says, read. He says, ma ana biqari'in, I cannot read. Prophet said, Jibreel said to him again, and squeezed his hand, iqra. He says, ma ana biqari'in. He says, I cannot read. And then it was revealed, iqra, bismi rabbika lalli khalaq. And so, some of the, uh, and, and, uh, and a few other verses. Read, uh, uh, by the name of your Lord, the one who is created, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق the one who has created you or the one who has created طيب نبي أبي اقرأ so this is the first thing that was revealed to him but for a couple of days he was just having that realization of the prophethood and he wasn't told to spread the message yet but he was sent with messengership and to spread the message when it was said to when يا أيها المدثر was revealed يا أيها المدثر oh you um, covered in garment and cloth. Qum fa'anvir, rise and warn. Qum fa'anvir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir and praise your Lord. Wa thiyabaka fa'tahir and cleanse your clothes. Wa rujza fa'hjur. The author, he says, Qum fa'anvir, ay, yunviru anil shirki wa yad'u ila tawheed. He says, stand up and warn against shirk and call to tawheed. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And praise your Lord. أَيْ كَبِّرْهُ بِالتَّكْبِيرِ كَبِّرْهُ عَفْوًا عَظِّمْهُ بِالتَّوْحِيدِ Meaning glorify him and make him great by way of singing him out in Tawheed. وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِرْ And cleanse your clothes. Meaning purify and make sure none of your actions fall within shirk or not shirk doesn't enter into any of your actions of inam. وَالرُّجْزَ فَهَجُرْ الرُّجْزُ الْأَصْنَامِ الرُّجْزُ is um, uh, do you have who's who got translation? Khalas, no one has translation. Al Ruj. Huh? Al Ruj is like impurity. Ala kulli hal, Al Ruj is like impurity, and he explained it to be Al Asnam, to be idols. وَهَجْرُهَا تَرْكُهَا وَالْبَرَأَةُ مِنْهَا وَأَهْلُهَا And to boycott it is that you leave alone these idols, that you free yourself from them and its people. And we mentioned already how to free yourself from shirk and its people, that you do not associate in their festivals and their lives and their kufriyat. طيب. So that's what he was sent with. What did he do? 
أخذ على هذا عشر سنين يدعو إلى التوحيد وبعد العشر عرج به إلى السماء وفرضت عليه الصلوات الخمس وصلى في مكة ثلاث سنين ثم أمر وبعدها أمر بالهجرة إلى المدينة This توحيد that he was told to relay and to warn against shirk أخذ على هذا عشر سنين He was upon that for ten years Ten years he was calling to توحيد Ten years he was warning against shirk Ten years and the main focus and the vocal point of the da'wah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the manhaj of the Prophet is to call to Tawheed first and foremost and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he did that for 10 whole years now the first, the first thing he is uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the first thing he was revealed with was not you have to stay away from alcohol the first thing that was revealed to him was not uh, tell the women to wear hijab no, there was no hijab there was no uh, forbiddance of alcohol. There was no, um, all these, uh, there was no adhan. There was no zakayat. There was no fasting. There was no hajj. There was no umrah yet. Ten whole years, tawheed, teaching the people to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone, telling them about Allah Azza wa Jal, telling them about the day of judgment, telling them about Jannah and now for ten whole years. And this should be the da'wah of anyone that calls to da'wah. Any masjid that begins with da'wah, the first thing that we should call the people to is Tawheed. Then, after 10 years, عُرِجَ بِهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ The Prophet ﷺ was taken to the heavens. He was taken from his house. Jibreel came to him. His heart was cleansed. His, his chest was ripped open for the second time. Once when he was a child. The second time is in the night journey at Isra wa Mi'raj. His chest was opened up. His heart was taken out, it was cleansed, and it was put back in and sold back up. Then he went with Jibreel on a riding beast called Al Burq. And this riding beast is not like any car you see today. Ferrari, what's the maximum speed it goes in? Uh, who knows the cars? You know, yeah, mashallah. Alright. This riding beast, you know how fast it goes? It sees something, the last point of its sight, it automatically goes there. Then the next, the last point of his sight automatically goes there. Yeah, I mean, it travels at the distance of your sight, how far you can see. This is Al-Burq. So Jibreel alayhi salam took the Prophet sallam, on this riding beast and they went from Mecca to Jerusalem to Philistine, Al-Aqsa, to Masjid Al-Aqsa, and he prayed there. And then he, Urija bihi al sama he was taken to the heaven, the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, the seventh heaven, and he met the messengers and some of the prophets and he spoke to them. Then, he went to Sidrat al-Muntaha and Jibreel said, I cannot go past this tree. And he went further, the Prophet was allowed to go further. And he spoke to Allah Azza wa Jal directly. Allah, he couldn't see Allah, obviously no one can see Allah Azza wa Jal in the dunya, except for in the Jannah and the Yawm Qiyamah. But he spoke to Allah Azza wa Jal directly, just like Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to Musa directly. So Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to him directly and commanded him with the five prayers, the five daily prayers. What does this show? This shows you the high station of the Salah. The Salah was not revealed on earth. It's the only action in Islam where it was not revealed on earth. The Prophet had to be taken to the highest heaven, above the seventh heaven, up further than the Sidrat al Muntaha. And in that high station, Allah just spoke to him directly, commanding him with the prayer, which shows you the high station of the Salah. So they prayed in Mecca for three years. So the prayer was established and they prayed for three years in Mecca. Then he made hijrah and migration to Medina. If the adhan comes in, make the adhan. If the adhan comes in, make the adhan. And continue between adhan and Qam. He was, he, was, he was commanded to make hijrah to Medina from Mecca because they were being persecuted in Mecca and they could not practice their religion. Notice, in Bab al Fa'idah, when they were in Mecca, they were not in charge and they were not in control. When they were being persecuted and punished and harmed, did the Muslims say, let's go protest, let's lift banners and go around the Kaaba and say, we want freedom, when do we want it, we want it now, whatever they say. <laughs> did they say that? Did they protest? No. They never protested. The Prophet asked them and commanded them to be patient. And some of them that never had that much protection, he commanded them to go to Habasha because there was a Christian king 
who is still the land of Kufr, still a land of Kufr. Mecca was a land of Kufr, and Habasha was a land of Kufr. But Habasha had a leader that was just. He wouldn't oppress the people, so they went. Al Muhim, they um, they were patient upon their hal, and if they couldn't practice their religion, they moved. And so likewise, us now living in the land of Kufr, because Mecca back then was a land of Kufr, we are patient upon the harms that we see and any persecution. But if it gets to the stage where we can't practice our religion, like some other countries where, you, where it's banned to wear hijab under 18, where it's banned to grow your beard, where it's banned to pray the salah, then it's wajib for us to make hijrah. And if we can't go to a Muslim country, then at least migrate to another Catholic country that is we're better off than that place where you can practice your religion. Then he talks about hijrah and he mentions that hijrah is an intiqal min balad al-shirk ila balad al-islam. Hijrah is that you migrate from the lands of kufr to the lands of the Muslims. That is what the maqsood of the author here is with hijrah. But hijrah has many other terms or meanings. Another meaning which is more broad is that a person makes hijrah, migration, from the sins and those things that displease Allah Azawajal and disobedience. That a person migrates from evil and from the sins that he's performing towards Allah Azawajal and the obedience. And this is something that is obligatory upon every single Muslim. This type of hijrah with this meaning is obligatory upon every Muslim. As for the general, the other meaning which is to go from the land of the Kufr to the land of the Muslims, it is obligatory upon everyone that cannot practice their religion in the land of Kufar. And the person who can practice his religion, he's allowed to stay there, but it's sunnah and recommended that he goes to the land of the Muslims. It's sunnah, if you, so we can practice our religion here, more or less. It's sunnah for us to go to the land of Muslim like Hijrah, and there's great reward in it. But if we can't, and we can practice our religion, then we're allowed to stay here. But if the moment comes where you can't practice your religion here, then it's wajib upon us to make hijrah. But the thing that is wajib upon every Muslim at every time and every moment is he does hijrah from the sins and from disobedience to the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then he mentions that hijrah is obligatory upon this ummah to go from Bilal al-Shirk ila Bilal al-Islam if they cannot practice their religion. And this is something that is going to stay until Qiyam al saa the hukam of it. Then he mentions the evidence in the Ladina to Afam al Indeed, those people that the angels, the death comes to them and the angels, um, those people that oppress themselves and the angels come to them at the time of death and they are ظالمي and فسيهم and they oppress their souls. قالوا فيما كنتم The angels will ask them, those people that oppress themselves, what state were you in? قالوا كنا مستضعفين في الأرض They will say, تفضل تفضل. We'll continue after the Adhan and we'll finish the book inshallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah
الله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده. طيب. To continue, shall we try finish before the salah? He mentions um, two verses where he mentions quickly that the people that died and they were oppressing themselves, they were upon sin. The angels will ask them, what state were you in? And they will say, that we were weak and we were oppressed in the land. Basically they're saying the land that we lived in was oppressive to us and we had no control over it. So the angels will tell them, Alam takun was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you so that you might break to another land where you can worship him? And then Allah mentions, they, they will mention that they have a severe punishment and then he makes istithna, exception for those that were weak from the elderly men and women and children that could not find a way to make hijrah then they are excused and Allah Azawajal will forgive them. And he mentions another verse similar to it. Oh my slaves that have believed in the Abdu Wasiatun for Iya Fa'udun, my land my earth and my land is spacious, my earth is spacious, so worship me alone. Bagawi, Imam al Bagawi, he's from the ulama of the Mutaqadimin, he said, Sabah Ruzuli Hadi al Ayah, Fin Muslimin al Ladina bi Makka tell him you had your own Adam Allah is me iman. Allah is going to reveal this verse with regards to those believers that did not make hijrah and they were in Mecca at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was obligatory to make hijrah to Medina, the beginning of Islam. Some people that never made hijrah, they were still Muslims even though they were sinful because Allah still called them, uh, all you who have believed, he called them with Iman. And hijrah from Mecca to Medina, after Fath Mecca, after the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح He said there is no hijrah from Mecca after the conquering. Meaning, Mecca will forever be a land of the Muslims and no one can ever claim to be making hijrah from Mecca to another land. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح After the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, Mecca will forever be a land of the Muslims. And this is a proof and a refutation against those people that declare the Muslims to be kuffar and there is no land of the Muslims that is Muslim. Every land is Dar Harb. Every land is land of Kuffar. All the Muslims are disbelievers. Some people that are extreme that claim this, that are called Khawarij and Takfiris, they go to the extent where they say that Mecca and Medina is a land of Kuffar, not a land of Muslims. To that extent, that's how deviated they became. Refutation against them is the Prophet said, La ba'd al that they will never be hijrah from. Mecca after the country because it will forever be a land of Muslims. Then he mentions the evidence of Hijrah from the Sunnah. He mentioned after he mentioned the evidence from the Quran, he mentions لا تنقطع الهجرة حتى تنقطع التوبة ولا تنقطع التوبة حتى تطلع الشمس من مغربها. That Hijrah and migration from the land of the Kuffar to the land of the Muslims will not be cut off. It will exist forever as a ruling and reality. حتى تنقطع التوبة up until Tawbah and repentance is cut off. And repentance is not cut off and it's never too late to make repentance up until the sun rises from the Maghrib, rises from the west. The sun every morning rises from the east. When the sun rises from the west, that means it is the establishment of the hour and it's too late to believe. So it's too late to make Tawbah, so it's too late to emigrate. So and up until then, you can still make Tawbah to Allah and you can still make Hijrah to the land of the Muslims. Then he says, فَلَمَّا اسْتَقَرَّ بِالْمَدِينَةِ أُمَرَ بِبَقِيَةِ الشَّرَاءِ وَالْإِسْلَامِ فِي الزَّكَاةِ وَالصُّمُّ وَالْحَجِّ وَالْجِهَادِ وَالْأَذَانِ وَالْأَمْرِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالْمُنْهَيْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَغَيْرِ ذَلِكَ مِنْ شَرَائِعِ الْإِسْلَامِ So he spent 13 years in Mecca, 10 years according to Tawheed, 3 years the Salah was established so he prayed in Mecca 3 years, then there was 10 years where he was in Medina after he migrated to Medina. For the 10 years where he was in Medina, the rest of the legislations of Islam were revealed to him. From them is zakah. Giving zakah was obligated in Medina. Psalm, fasting, the adhan, making the call to prayer, and commanding with the good and forbidding the evil, and jihad, and hajj, and other than that from the actions, they were all revealed later in Medina. <laughs> the Prophet stuck to that for another 10 years, according to the rest of these legislations. Then he says, وَبَعْدَهَا تُوْفِيَا صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَدِينُهُ بَاقَ 
Then after 10 years, when the 63 years was complete, the Prophet وسلم, he passed away. And his religion remains. The religion remains after the death of the Prophet وسلم, And this is his religion, what we are studying now. There is no good except that the Prophet ﷺ commanded his ummah with it and guided his nation to it. There is no evil except that the Prophet ﷺ warned his nation from it. And the khayr, the head of the goodness and the things that are good that the Prophet ﷺ commanded his nation with is a tawheed, as we said, as the greatest commandment. And everything that Allah Azza wa is pleased with and loves. And the things that he warned against, the head of it is a shirk. So it's associate partners with Allah. And everything that Allah Azza wa dislikes and despises. Then he says, Up until here. Allah Azza wa Jal sent him to all of the people, all of the mankind, the jinn and the ins, the jinn and the human beings. Allah has made it obligatory upon all of mankind, jinn and ins, that they should obey him and listen to him. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Say, O Messenger, I, O people, O people, I am a messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal to you all, Jami'an, all of you. And then the author, he says, وَأَكْمَلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ الدِّينِ Allah Azza wa Jal completed by way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the religion. The evidence is the statement of Allah. الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Today, I have completed for you your religion and I have, وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي and I have uh, completed for you my favor and I have been pleased for you as Islam, as a religion. So Allah Azza wa Jal completed the religion with the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> The evidence that the Prophet Sallallahu died and we believe he died. Some people deviate to sex, they believe the Prophet is still alive and he never died. The evidence from the Quran is إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Indeed you, and the address is to the Prophet Sallallahu first, وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ إِنَّكَ you will die, وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ And they will die. All of us will pass away. No one will escape death. ثُمَّ إِنَّكُمْ يَوْمَ قِيَامَةُ عِنْدَ رَبِّكُمْ تَخْتَصِمُونَ Then all of you will be resurrected uh, on the day of judgment in front of your Lord. And ثُمَّ إِنَّكُمْ يَوْمَ قِيَامَةُ عِنْدَ رَبِّكُمْ تَخْتَصِمُونَ طيب. والناس إلى ما يبعثون والدليل قوله تعالى منها خلقناكم وفيها نعيدكم منها نخرجكم تارة أخرى وقوله تعالى والله عنباتكم من الأرض نباتا ثم يعيدكم فيها ويخرجكم إخراجا And when the people, all of them, they died and all of us will die يبعثون, they will all be resurrected likewise The evidence is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal From it we have created you, meaning the earth From it we have created you and to it will return you. You will return to the earth and the grave. And from it, a third time we will resurrect you again. Or a second time or another time. And the evidence as well. Allah He will make you crop up from the earth like Nabat. Then He will return you to it. And then once again He will um, exit you from the earth. And after death, they will be taken to account and they will be judged for their deeds. The evidence is Allah mentions that every, the one that does evil, he will be given evil judge, uh, a recompense and the one that does good will be given good. Whoever disbelieves in the ba'ath, the resurrection, whoever disbelieves in it, is a kafir. The evidence is, The people who have disbelieved, they rejected that they will be resurrected. Say by Allah Azza wa Jal, you will be resurrected. Then you will be told of your deeds. And that is easy. For Allah Azza wa Jal to round up so we don't have to come back after Salah. In short, he mentions next 
that the messengers were sent to all of mankind and the first of the messengers is Nuh and the last of the messengers is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi then he mentions the evidences for that then he mentions the first thing that every messenger was called to which is Tawheed and he mentions the evidence for that then he mentions that Tawood the people that are false gods they are many and they are everyone that increases upon his head and the head of them is five Iblis Allah that the Iblis may Allah um, curse him and then he mentions four other types of Tawaheed and then he says the evidence for that La ikraha fi deen there is no compulsion in the religion Qad tabayna rushdu min al-bayt and in there he basically mentions negation and affirmation of Tawheed then he says this is the meaning of La ilaha illallah خلاص من تتعينا finish the last hadith he says this is the meaning of La ilaha illallah and he says رأس الأمر the head of the affair is Al-Islam and its main pillar is the prayer and dirwa to salam he is jihad fi sabirillah and that is the end of the risala wa billahi tawfiq wa jazakum khair for your patience when we establish the prayer assalamu alaikum